In this module, we'll learn about syllables and syllable structure. Our main content will be to understand the basic parts of a syllable and to recognize them, to understand the constraints that languages have on possible syllable structures, also ways that learners learn to pronounce more complex syllables than their native language allows, We'll talk about specific phonotactic constraints and novel syllables, and then syllable structure-based neutralization between phonemes, followed by some reminders about allophonic rules and how syllable structure plays a role in that. Okay, the basic parts of a syllable are three. There's an onset, a nucleus, and a coda. So, Onset means beginning, nucleus sort of means something in the middle, you probably recognize that word from biology, and if you're a musician you might recognize coda as meaning the ending part to a song or a part that, that appears at the very end. And that's basically what happens. So if we see the English word strikes, stru is the onset, what comes first, I is the nucleus. This would be the, the middle part that actually carries the sound, that if you were to shout this word across a long distance that would be the part that's really communicating, and then k would be any consonants which appear after the nucleus. So str, consonants which appear before the nucleus, the nucleus, and the coda is the consonants which appear after, strikes. We could have no onset in the word asps, which has a very complex coda, <laughs> there's three consonants in the coda. I could have the word turk, uh, t and then in this case, Remember we have these four consonants where in English the consonant itself can act as the nucleus. Er like in Turk, ul like in little, m like in bottom, bottom, and n can do that sometimes even like in button where the n is the nucleus. Um, and then the coda would be a k. We could have just a single syllable, o, o, where only the whole syllable is just one vowel, one nucleus. Or I could have a single consonant after, like the word or. Or I could have two consonants in the onset and no coda, play. All of these are possible syllables. The nucleus and coda together are what we call the rhyme, because in Western rhyming schemes, this is the part that would have to stay, say, stay the same if I was going to rhyme with it. So what rhymes with strikes, maybe pikes or bikes, but the ikes part would have to stay the same. What rhymes with asps, I guess clasps or rasps, but this would have to stay the same. What rhymes with Turk? Well, work, jerk, um, merk, but this irk part would have to stay the same. So that's why we call that part the rhyme. Um, and English has a very complex syllable structure. Here these little things mean that it's optional, that I could have one. I have to have at least one vowel in the nucleus, but I could have two. Then I could have up to three consonants in the onset, as long as the first one was an S. I can't have any other three consonants, but I can have an S and then two more. And then the coda can have three consonants as well, although it helps certainly if this last one is an S, but it doesn't have to be that way. So we have a very complex syllable structure. Mandarin Chinese, on the other hand, has a very simple one. You could have one vowel as an onset, you could have a diphthong or even a triphthong, like in a word like shui, where u -ai, that would all be the, the nucleus, three vowel targets. I can only have a single consonant. I can't have a cluster of two. And the only possible consonant that could appear as a coda would be na or na. There's no other consonants which can appear in this coda position. So it has a much more simple syllable structure. There's a famous uh, story of a reverend. He was a don at Oxford College. And he, his last name was Spooner. He often did this thing where he would switch the onsets of one syllable with the onsets of a following syllable. So instead of saying a link to click, he might say a lick to clink, um, where in this case he's actually keeping the onset but switching the, the coda. Um, sparking pots instead of parking spots, so he's switching uh, the onsets here and keeping the rhyme the same. A uh, stracing ripe instead of racing stripe. Again, switching the onsets but keeping the rhyme the same. He sort of had some kind of thing with his brain that he often did this and switched them. And, and we do this. This is a little kind of speech error that we often make where we actually 
strip the onset off. And this is evidence that we store the onset of a syllable separately from the rhyme, that the onset has a special position, which is why it's easy for most speakers to actually come up with words that rhyme, because we can easily strip off the onset and replace it with other ones. So if I was going to break up a syllable, and the, the Greek letter sigma is sometimes used as a, a symbol for a syllable, um, I would divide it into the onset and the rhyme would be the first division. The rhyme could consist of a nucleus and an optional coda. And then it, this is a very long English word. This onset shows that it has three consonants. There's one vowel as the nucleus and there's three consonants in the coda. And there's several different words that this could potentially be um, in English, but let's say that this is the one sprints. So sp, sp would be the onset, sp, sp, the nucleus is just it, and then the coda would be n, t, s, n, t, n, t. So sprints. It's a very complex syllable with seven segments in a single syllable. Um, when words get borrowed from one culture to another, the problem is that these words get borrowed into a language that may have very different constraints on what a possible syllable can be. An example of this would be Hawaiian language, which has the simplest possible syllable structure. You can have a vowel as the nucleus, you can never have a coda in the entire language, and you can have a single consonant as the onset. So Merry Christmas became Meli Kalikimaki, Meli Kalikimaki in Hawaiian. Part of this is because it only has 14 phonemes in the whole language, so things like s and t don't exist in this language, or r, so this was the closest that could come, but you can see Merry Christmas, which is four syllables in English, um, it ends up becoming one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a seven syllable word in Hawaiian. Japanese has a slightly more complex syllable structure. You can end a syllable with a n. You can have a n in the coda, but like Hawaiian, there's no consonant clusters. So McDonald's would be makudonarado, makudonarado. So McDonald's is three syllables in English. It's six in Japanese. Baseball is two syllables in English. Beisuboru. It's five syllables in Japanese. Um, Korean has a CV and you can have any stop as the coda, um, any put, a, ka, anything like that. So when I lived in Korea, the football team of the city I lived in was called the Steelers because there was a big steel mill in Pohang. But at the games, people would chant Sutilozu, because in Korean, Steelers, which is a two syllable word in English, becomes a four syllable word in Korean. Um, fork when they borrowed forks into Korean culture, they took the English word fork. Um, I can't have a, a consonant cluster, so for ku. Actually, I can't end with an R, so it became fo ku. And Korean has no f sound actually at all. They have to replace fo with a P, so it ends up becoming pronounced as po ku. Po ku. Po ku. So that is the word for fork. It's one syllable in English, two in Korean. So there's constraints about what kinds of syllables are possible in terms of how many consonants in the onset, how many consonants in the coda, how many vowels in the nucleus, but also exactly which ones are allowed is distinct or distinguished. So we can see that some of these are possible English words, even though none of them are English words, and some of them are impossible English words. So ptak, although English allows you to have two consonants in the onset, it never allows a p and a t together. So if we get a word like pterodactyl, ptera was Greek for wing, we end up deleting this p, we have to pronounce it as pterodactyl. So the Russian word ptak, which means bird, um, is really a struggle for English learners of Russian to say vuil. We never allow a thw cluster in the onset in English. Hlaf, this used to be the word for bread in English, but we long since got rid of the ability for h to form consonant clusters at the beginning. Um, plaft, this one is an okay English word. It fits, we've got two consonants in the onset, two consonants in the coda, and we're allowed to have a pl or a foot, like craft or play. This is just an accidental hole in the English that this possible word doesn't happen to be one. Sram, we're not allowed to have s and r as a cluster together. Mgla, we definitely don't allow mgla 
although this means of the fog um, in Russian. Um, vlas, we don't allow v and l together, although if you grew up eating vlasic pickles or if you learned about Vlad the Impaler, you might have learned to say the vla cluster by borrowings from Slavic languages. Flut, it's not an English word, but it is a possible one. Dnom, we're not able to make this cluster as English speakers. Rtut, we definitely can't make that cluster. Tusp is a possible English word. There's nothing about the English phonotactics that violates this. And nupe, we don't have a word nupe, but we do have a word newt. So potentially this is possibly an English word. So we can see that even though these are all possible syllables in English in terms of the number of consonants or the number of vowels, it really matters which consonants can form a cluster in a given language and which ones can't. And that's called the phonotactic. So these phonotactic constraints, they're limits to where certain sounds can appear. Let's look at four words um, which an English learner of another language might encounter. Fne would be a Russian prefix meaning interior or inside of. We don't allow you to say fne, 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 fne in English. So that might be really hard to pronounce. Um, tre, tre, this is the first syllable of the old capital of the Republic of Georgia, treta, tre. Uh, we definitely don't allow these three consonants to get, actually, we don't even have the consonant t or the consonant h, let alone being able to string them together. Rta means of the mouth in Russian. Again, to say rta, rta is really tricky. And then the very common Vietnamese word, when, doesn't seem like it's that hard, but we're not used to pronouncing a la at the beginning of a word, when, when. These clusters violate some basic phonotactic rules for English. Phonotactic rules kind of spell out what are the possible syllables that you can say. We have a rule in English that you can never have a cluster uh, with a nasal um, in the onset position. So I can never have tna or ta as the beginning, but I can have can't. I can do that in the coda position. Um, the phoneme un can only be a coda. I can never have un in an onset position, like mu, wen, nga, um, but there are many languages that allow that. Lax vowels must have a coda afterwards. This is a long-standing rule in English. I can have a word me or ma or me, but I can't have a word mit. That's what this asterisk means. I can't have a word ma, ma. A very interesting innovation in the English language is we have this word meh, which is spelled M-E-H. It kind of like, ah, how do you feel? Meh, meh. This may be the first time in the whole history of the English language that we allow a lax vowel phoneme to appear without a coda consonant afterwards. Language is constantly innovating, and sometimes we throw off old constraints. Tz is not a possible cluster for onsets in English. So when people borrowed the Russian word tsar, where that's just fine, a lot of times people would reanalyze this as being czar, so saying the drug czar, not the drug tsar. And for the tsitsi fly, some people say the tsitsi fly because they can't actually pronounce tsa at the beginning of a word, even though they can say pizza just fine, which has tsa in the onset of that second syllable. Um, an interesting sort of consequence of these phonotactic constraints, Mandarin is a highly constrained language. There's only 408 possible syllables with all of the consonants and vowels um, that are allowed. You can times that by four by adding phonemic tone, which we'll talk about in another module. But that's still not many. If you think of that, there's only 408 possible syllables to use for the entire language. English, on the other hand, there's over 10,000 single syllable words in English, monosyllabic words we call them. And there's over 15,000 different syllables if we also add the ones that don't appear as a monosyllabic, a single syllable word, but that do appear in polysyllabic or do appear within multisyllabic words. So whereas Mandarin has, you know, maybe 1,600 possible syllables, even if you add tone, English has over 15,000. So English is a much less constrained language. This can make it really hard for Chinese learners of English to learn how to pronounce these English syllables when the vast majority of English syllables is forbidden in their own native sound system and is impossible for them to say. So when we encounter a cluster or a syllable that is impossible for us to say, learners have two different tendencies. 
one tendency will be to reduce clusters, reduce consonant clusters by throwing away sounds. So Vietnamese or Chinese L1 learners of English will tend to do this. So if we have the word fifths, fifths, we actually have three fricatives at the end in the coda, f, th, s. So even English speakers will often reduce this to fifths, fifths, and we'll drop that th sound because it's hard to say. For Vietnamese and Chinese, this might actually just become fis or or fis or fif, that they would only keep one of those consonants, which is more than complicated enough. Um, or there could be the tendency, rather than dropping a consonant or deleting a consonant, to in insert vowels. This is like that Steelers example I showed you with Korean, where it became sutilerge, because there's no erz at the beginning, there's no st at the beginning, so it became sutilerge. Le j, or Japanese McDonald's, which ends with le de z, became da ra du. So they just inserted vowels between all of those. It could have been na ra du j, na ra du j, if they were going to keep all of those, but maka de na ra du j might have already been a little bit too long. <laughs> Uh, which is your tendency? I guess you can test this. If you get this Russian word rta, um, do you say ta or do you say rta? Do you add a vowel? For the Georgian word mshvi, do you say mshvi or mshavi or do you just say shvi? Um, for the Georgian syllable mtche, do you say mtche or mtche, mtche? Do you insert vowels or do you just try to simplify it maybe by deleting the M at the beginning, tche, tche, or maybe even just saying tche, tche. Um, the Russian syllable ftran, do you say ftran or do you say fran or ftan? Um, is it, are you a deleter or are you an inserter? And this, this becomes really important um, if we're teaching English, for example. We have these words like screen, sclerosis, squeak, skewer, street, stew, sprayed, spew. All of these have super complex three consonant clusters in the beginning of the syllable. So one thing you could do is have them clap for each syllable, like screen, dog, cat, butter. And if you teach them to do that, they could see, do they say screen or do they say screen? Screen, screen, screen. Um, you can have learners record themselves saying a word like screen and have you record a word screen and have them toggle back and forth. And this is easy to do with a computer uh, or with sound editing software. Is it screen or screen? Is it square or square? Square. Three syllables or not. There's a really neat little app called Elsa which you can download. Um, this is an app which really helps people who are more the deleters, who delete, get rid of a consonant. It actually has computer software built in that will listen to make sure that you're pronouncing all of the consonants in the cluster without inserting too many vowels. Or you can even have learners speak into a spectrogram and, and you can actually see, are they pronouncing a vowel or not? Is it two syllables or is it one? Another consequence of these uh, phonotactic rules is neutralization. So two sounds might normally form a minimal pair in a language. If you switched one for the other, it would change the meaning of the word. But in a particular place within the syllable, that contrast, that phonemic contrast, ends up disappearing. In a certain phonotactic environment, with a certain neighboring sound or a certain syllable position, they no longer contrast with each other. A good example of this would be it and e. We know it and e are that forms a minimal pair in the English language. Hit is different than heat. Um, mit is different than meat. And sin, this word sin, is different than seen. It's got the E phoneme here, the E. But before an ng, I can no longer make a contrast between E and E. Sim, seem, sin, seen. But sing, 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 sing. It sounds the same, so it's very hard to know if I was going to phonemically transcribe what phonemes is sing made of. Definitely a s, definitely ng, but this middle phoneme, it's hard to see. Is it made of s i ng or s e ng? The answer is actually impossible to find out because no English speaker ever contrasts e and i before this velar nasal, before an ng. So it really doesn't matter if you transcribe it this way or this way. Both are right because this distinction has been lost. 
Um, there's no distinction between na and ng before ga or ka. So if I think of the word s-i-n-k, I can't say sink or sink. It could be s-i underlyingly with the phoneme na, and that na just becomes pronounced as a na as the velar nasal because it's before velar sound, but I'll never know. Sing, sink, is it, is sing, s-i-n, g, or is sink, s-i, n, k, or s-i, n, k, or um, anger, is it a, n, g, or is it a, n, g? I'll never know the answer because there's no contrast between na and nga before these two consonants. Same thing pa and ba after an s. Anytime I would try to put a b phoneme after an s, I'm going to end up with exactly the same pronunciation as if I had done a p. We talked about that Italian chain sparo in the mall, which I would say sparo, sparo. Whether I pronounce it with a p in my brain or a b, it'll end up exactly the same. Or T and D often get neutralized between vowels. We saw this with writer and rider. If I'm very careful, I hear it, but normally writer, writer, that, that this distinction between T and D gets neutralized in that particular environment. So we say that the phonemic contrast is neutralized in an environment. There's no longer any difference, phonemic difference, between those two sounds. We also saw that many allophonic rules depend on the syllable structure. So in English, we saw that the phoneme P gets pronounced as an aspirated P if it's in the onset, or a, an unreleased P if it's in the coda. The Koreans have a single phoneme, er, er, er. And this er will get pronounced as a r in the onset, rak, ryung. Um, and it'll tend to get pronounced al in the coda, kal, tal, uh, uh, uh. Um, so these would sound like two totally different phonemes for an English speaker, but they're allophones of the same phoneme. It just depends how this sound gets pronounced. It's more like a ra in onset position, more like the English la in a coda position. Um, and Russian and German, this happens with their stops as well. Any voiced stop, not just a ga, um, will be voiced if it's in the onset position, um, gol, but it will become voiceless in the coda position, luk. So the difference between lug, uh, which means meadow, and luk, which means onion, is lost in Russian because g gets pronounced as a k, the same as the k phoneme would get pronounced as a k.